distant fall How it ends It's the fall Welcome to another session of Physio TV. I'm Dr. Shreya Menden, a final year postgraduate student in community physiotherapy here at Sanjeeti Institute of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation College of Physiotherapy. So the topic for today is principles of ergonomics. So this is an important question and also it's frequently asked in the industrial therapy uh, topic. So today we'll be talking about uh, what exactly ergonomics is. Why is it important that we study about it? Uh, what are the different types or uh, domains of ergonomics and uh, its principles? So we'll start with what exactly ergonomics is. So the term comes from these two Greek words, ergon meaning work and nomos meaning rule. So it basically means rules of work. So the operation definition of ergonomics is that it is an interdisciplinary field of study that seeks to design tools, equipment and tasks in order to optimize human capabilities. So uh, interdisciplinary field meaning that there are various disciplines that are involved such as anthropometrics, biomechanics, uh, engineering design, uh, industrial design, engineering, physiology, psychology, all of that. And uh, it, yeah, so these tools can be anything uh, like a simple hand uh, tool such as scissors or it can be a written set of instructions. Equipment meaning it can be uh, any device or an appliance. Tasks can be any physical or mental tasks. So what ergonomics aims to do is that it wants to improve the interrelationship between a human and a system. So, uh, so there are some other terms or synonyms that are used uh, to describe this field. The first one is man-machine systems. So what this means is that it consists of a human operator or a group of operators and a machine via which a task is done. So that task can be processing of information or it can be the production of goods. So to give you an example, uh, a data entry operator and a computer is nothing but a man-machine system or a driver and a car. The other term is human system interface, sometimes also called as a human uh, machine interface. So this is nothing but a user interface or a dashboard that connects a human to a machine or a device. So uh, example would be the keyboard that, that we use, touch screens or even virtual reality devices. And the last one is human factors engineering. So this is basically a separate discipline that deals with the design of tools or equipment or systems such that uh, they take into account all uh, human abilities and uh, limitations. So basically their design is to create things such that they are not only safe, but they're also comfortable and humans can effectively use them. 
Now, uh, so why is this so important? Why do we have to study about ergonomics? So the first one is that it helps us recognize uh, WRMSD. So what does that mean? It is nothing but work-related musculoskeletal disorders. So this is nothing but a group of physical disorders that uh, in which there is wear and tear of the tissues that are surrounding the joints as a result of your work duties. So why is this important? Because if this happens, it can affect your work performance. Next, we come to improve quality and productivity. So how does ergonomics help with improving quality? So say, for example, there is a workplace that has poor ergonomics. Say, for example, uh, an employee has a very physically demanding task to perform. And because of that, he becomes very fatigued, becomes uh, very frustrated. And that is, but of course, he will not be able to perform his work as well he can. And so the quality is going to be affected. Then coming on to uh, productivity. If we have an efficient workstation such that, you know, there are good reaches and heights, there is uh, there's no discomfort that the employee has to uh, face. So, but of course, with all of these things in mind, the productivity of the employee will be more. And then it helps to reduce costs. So, how does this happen? Because we are minimizing these work-related MSDs. So, as a result of that, because of work-related musculoskeletal disorders, there's a lot of, there are lost working productive days. Uh, there's worker compensation claims. So, we are minimizing that. So, but of course, this cost is going to come down. And then it helps us enhance employee uh, engagement. So, um, so when we have an efficient workstation, you know, such that the employee is not fatigued, he has, uh, uh, he is able to work uh, without, you know, any sort of discomfort. But of course, his morale is going to be improved. They, uh, they are going to understand that the company cares about his or her safety. All of that is taken care of. So, but of course, his productivity and involvement is going to be increased. And like we previously spoke about, it's going to help in designing workplaces that take into account human characteristics. So uh, moving on to the types or domains of ergonomics. So uh, there are basically these three different types. Physical ergonomics basically deals with the human body. So uh, this is what is most talked about. So basically in physical ergonomics, uh, physical tasks or activities, uh, they're going to be seeing how this interconnects with factors like uh, bio biomechanical factors, anatomical factors, physiological factors, all of those. Cognitive ergonomics is all about the human brain, how that is going to work. And then organizational ergonomics is all about uh, uh, organ uh, how or, uh, systems and uh, work systems and cultures take place. So we'll start with the first one, principles of physical ergonomics. Coming to the first one, that is working in neutral posture. So we need to understand what exactly is a neutral posture and what is an awkward posture. So neutral postures are all those postures in which the body is aligned and it is balanced and there is minimal stress placed on the on all the joints and the body overall. And the opposite of it, so also in neutral postures, the advantage is that in this posture, you have maximum control and uh, maximum control and production of force. And the exact opposite of it is what is an awkward posture. So anything that is not a neutral posture will uh, going towards the extremes of ranges of motion will be an awkward posture. So why, and that should be avoided because what happens is when uh, in an awkward, uh, in such a situation, there's a lot of stress that is placed on the musculoskeletal system. And as a result, you are prone to getting MSDs. And so that should be avoided. So uh, like we uh, can be seen in the pictures, it's very important to maintain the natural S-curve of the spine whenever we are doing any task in sitting or standing. So when we're sitting, how do we ensure that you can have a good lumbar support? And then similarly, your neck alignment is important. So in order to modify that, what we can see in the second picture on the right side, we can either adjust the station workstation height or we can just tilt the equipment so that our neck remains in a neutral posture. Similarly, your shoulders and elbows, as we can see in the last picture, your shoulders are not at all relaxed and the elbows are all uh, out and not by the side of the body. So we need to ensure that the shoulders are relaxed, the elbows are uh, nicely tucked in by the side of the body. So that our work also becomes easier. Then coming on to the next principle, that is keeping things in easy reach. Now, there are two things we need to understand here. That is, first is the reach envelope. So what does this mean? So whatever uh, things that I require when I, I'm doing my work, all the things that I frequently and constantly need, they should be within my reach envelope, meaning the reach envelope of my entire arm, my arms and my forearms. So if you notice in the first picture, it is a semicircle and not a rectangle, which is the usual shape of our workstations. 
So that is one thing. The second is zones of work. Now there's something called as a power zone or a comfort zone. So this is applicable when you are lifting objects. So this power zone is nothing but that area in between the mid chest and the mid thigh along with the hands in a handshake position that are very close to the body. So whenever I am lifting any object in this area, it's going to cause the least amount of effort. And anything above or below that, as we can see, is the danger zone and that is going to result in an MSD and it is going to cause problems. So uh, just to give you an example of the previous uh, principle working in neutral posture. So whenever uh, we are taking the blood pressure of a patient, we do ensure that the patient is in a supine lying or a sitting position, but we tend to be in a standing position and take the BP. But a better position to do that would be in sitting so that we're both at the same level and we can maintain in both postures are maintained. Another example is that when we are giving cervical traction or mobilization, Instead of doing it in standing, we can do it in sitting on a chair so that uh, we're both at the same level and it can be done properly. And to give you an example of keeping things in easy reach, say for example, in our uh, work setup, we have the plinth at one end and the modalities are kept very far apart. So we have to keep on reaching for it. So all of these long reaches, whenever you have to reach uh, way too far for, to grab an object so that you can, you're able to do your work. So what happens is you tend to bend, you tend to twist and you strain. That is going to again cause you a lot of discomfort. Then coming to the third principle that is uh, reducing excessive force. So whenever there's excessive force involved, there's going to be overuse of the muscles and that's going to result in fatigue and you're also prone to getting MSD. So like we can see in the first picture, because of the difference in the workstations, the lady has to lift and move the object every single time. That is going to be a lot more difficult. Similarly, in the sex, like, uh, second image, we can see that it's much easier to hold a box that has handholds rather than just lifting it by itself. So what happens is when we have this hand out, hand holds, our grip is basically this power grip. And that is much more efficient than the pinch grip, which we can see in the first picture. So the fingers alone cannot exert that much force and it's not going to be so efficient. And then lastly, uh, the best option is to just mechanize the activity. You can have machines do it. So you can use these uh, uh, air or hydraulic cylinders in order to do your work. So to give you a physiotherapy example, uh, when we are doing trigger point release or any uh, sort of uh, manual therapy using our thumbs. So what happens is when we're using our thumbs, there's a lot of pressure that's directed towards the CMC joint. And that can then result in pain, stiffness, and even dislocation in some cases. So to avoid that, a better way would be to use a thinar uh, part of our palms, or we, if it's a larger area, say for example, the leg or the back, or we can use our elbows if it is a smaller area. So with that, what we're doing is we're able to generate more force. It's going to be easier and it's not going to stress your joints. So that is one thing. So moving on to the next one, working at proper heights. Now, this is a very common uh, problem that we see at most workplaces that the height of the person and the height of their workstation is not matched. So because of that, again, there's going to be the uh, posture is not going to be proper. There's going to be fatigue. You're prone to getting injuries. And in most cases, this is going to depend, the height of the workstation is going to depend on what kind of work you're doing. So in most cases, working at the elbow height, like we can see in the first picture works, but that is not always the case. We can see in the second picture. So if uh, there's a lot of heavy work that is involved and you have to use a lot of upper body for it, then it's better to do it at a height that's below the elbow. Whereas if it's when the work is on the lighter side and uh, you it's, it involves a lot of precision and a lot of inspection, then it's better to do it at a height uh, above the elbow. So uh, similarly, so when uh, to give you another physiotherapy example, say for example, you want to do a uh, trapezius release on the neck of a patient. So we have the patient sitting on a plinth, but then we tend to you know get on our toes and trying to reach over to give the release. So better way to do that would be just to have the patient in prone lying and we can do it in standing. Or we can have the person sitting on a chair and we are standing and doing it. And sometimes if even that doesn't work, then we also have these adjustable plinths. So we can adjust uh, the height according to our own height and do it. So coming to the next principle, that is reducing excessive motions. So, but of course, whenever, whenever there's repetitive motion, and there's going to be a lot of wear and tear and your work is going to be very difficult. So like we can see in the first picture, because the two things are so apart, the person has to each and every time pick up an item, put it in the box, and it's going to be repeated a lot of times. And that can cause a lot of pain and discomfort in the end. The simple solution to that is to bring them closer and tilt the equipment such that you're just simply sliding it over. So it's a lot more efficient. And then again, you can always use tools and machines to do that repetitive motion rather than using it. 
So taking the similar previous example, if we have the modalities at one end, the plinth at one end, we have to do a lot of back and forth in between in order to apply it. So we can just simply have it closer so that it's much easier for us. Then coming on to the next principle, that is minimizing fatigue and static load. So in a lot of times, this fatigue is usually because of something called a static load. So now what does that mean? Static load is nothing that, uh, other than, so static load is what happens when you are attaining the same uh, position for a long period of time. So that is going to result in accidents, the work quality is going to reduce, the productivity is going to come down, and again, you will be prone to MSDs. A very common example for that is writer's cramp. So when we're using a pen or a pencil for a long period of time with a very small grip, there's a lot of pain, discomfort and which we experience. So a simple way to avoid that would be just to use a, a pen or with a larger grip and we can take breaks in between so that we avoid. Similarly, when someone has a standing job, it involves a lot of standing for men, quite a lot of hours. So what we can do is we can have a footrest as we can see in the last image. So we can alternate our legs in between so that we can relieve some of that load. And similarly, the first, as we can see in the first image, this is something called as a lean stand. The person can just change positions in between and relieve some of the load on those legs between, uh, in between their work. Coming on to the next uh, example, uh, next principle that is minimizing pressure points. So pressure points or contact stress is nothing but when uh, there's direct pressure against a body surface. So why is this important? Because if this occurs, it can impede uh, your nerve function and blood flow. So like if we can see in the first example, if you sit on a hard chair for a long period of time, and even if the chair, and sometimes it so happens that chair height is too high and our legs keep dangling. So when such a thing happens, you can notice there's a lot of discomfort that you experience at the back of the knee. So uh, this can simply be relieved by, you know, better cushioning, having a chair which has better cushioning and adjusting the height of the chair. The next example is that, where, you know, this is a very common example that even when we face when we are writing something. So the hard edge of the table is going to cause a lot of pressure and discomfort in the forearm. So, and again, there are some tools, you know, which the contour is such that it creates a lot of pressure in the palm. And this is another, this is all, this principle we also use in, while we're, you know, uh, giving wrist mobilization. So whenever we are doing that, we have the patient's wrist across the edge of the table. So we ensure that there is something placed beneath that, a towel roll or something, so that there's no friction and discomfort that the patient experiences. Then coming on to the eighth principle, that is providing clearance. So of course, clearance is important because you need to have adequate space, you need to have easy reaches, and there should be no barriers in between your work. There should be enough room for your neck, for your elbows, for your knees and your feet so that there's no bumping hazard and you don't have to work in a constrained posture. So uh, to give you an example, when say for example, we have to perform passive movements or uh, myofascial release, we need to ensure that we have enough space so that we can attain that wide stance position and we can move the joint throughout the range of motion without any barriers. In the way. Then... Coming on to the ninth principle, that is move, exercise and stretch. So we are all aware that the human body is designed to move. Uh, fitness is very important because it also impacts your work performance. So say someone has involved in a lot of heavy work. So it's very important that they perform a warm up prior to that. And uh, if someone is involved in a lot of periodic uh, sedentary work, sedentary work, so it's important that uh, they change their positions throughout the day, take breaks, do some uh, periodic stretch breaks in between. So one thing that needs to be understood here that there is no single best posture that you can work in throughout your entire day. You need to change your postures frequently and you need to move around so that again, you're not at the risk of MSDs. And then coming on to the last uh, principle. This is uh, maintaining a comfortable environment. So again, uh, this is going to be uh, your ideal environment will depend on what kind of work you are involved in. So there should be no extreme temperatures. If it is too cold, maybe using a ventilator or a cold air deflector may work. Or if it is too hot, you can use heat shields. Similarly, there should be no humidity or exposure to toxic or chemical substances, vibration. In case of a lot of uh, to dampen noise, there can be mufflers that can be used. So, uh, and also, the as you can see in the first picture, the lighting should be adequate such that there is no glare or shadow. 
And so this, uh, so we suppose we are giving motor point stimulation. So it's important that we have adequate lighting so that we're able to see the contraction. And similarly, as we can see in the next image, uh, this tool uh, is something that uh, uh, results in a lot of vibration. So there are these vibration dampening material that can be used in order to reduce the exposure. So, uh, so we are now done with the principles of ergonomics. So we'll now move on to what exactly is cognitive ergonomics. So cognitive ergonomics is all about the ability of the human mind to process information and uh, how we are going to uh, interpret the data. That is all cognitive ergonomics is about. So it includes a lot of training, a lot of decision making, mental workload, how we're going to analyze errors and workplace accidents. So what cognitive ergonomics talks about is uh, the first thing would be use of appropriate displays. So as we can see in the first image. So uh, displays, the type of displays matter because you want to convey information in a very easy and accurate way. Similarly, as we can see in the next image, patterns is something that humans can recognize easily. So it's much easier to interpret this bar graph as compared to just a list of numbers in a column. And then again, if you want to compare a data, bar graphs would be better and a line graph would be better if you want to show a trend. And then, so from a product perspective, Cognitive ergonomics focuses on how well a product is going to match the cognitive ability of the user. And similarly, from a design perspective, the products and systems should be created such that they're not only simple, but they're also clear and very easy to use. So as we can see in the first image, uh, the light switch. So someone uh, in the looking at the first image. So it will be but obvious that if I uh, flip up the switch, it's going to turn on the lights. But the same thing, if I make it horizontal, it's going to create a lot of confusion that which way it is to be done so that I switch so that I can switch on the light. Similarly, uh, icons are very useful if you want to quickly convey an information, especially if it's a warning sign. So that is all uh, cognitive ergonomics is about. And then coming on to the last one. That is organizational ergonomics. So what does this, the another another term for this uh, is, is macro ergonomics. So what exactly is this? It is nothing but the optimization of socio-technical systems. What does that mean? It is nothing but the organization structures, their policies, their processes. So it's basically all about the design of the workplaces, the interaction between the work system and the organization. So it's basically to put it in very simply, it's going to be how uh, you can like design work systems such that you can optimize the entire workplace. So in the it's obviously going to involve teamwork, how you're going to do uh, work shifts, how you're going to distribute the tasks and also what reward systems you have in place. So two things that we need to know here is there are two approaches when it comes to or organizational ergonomics. So one is the top down uh, approach. So what happens is this is those who are in the leadership or in the management positions, they are going to play an important role in deciding what is going to be the work structure, what is going to be the workflow, what uh, resources will you use in order to perform your work. And the other approach is your bottom up approach. So what happens is this is that uh, majority of the participation and input will be of the employees and they are going to be deciding on how to uh, identify a problem and also how to find solutions to it. So these are the two approaches in organizational ergon ergonomics. And lastly, we have occupational stress. So what does this mean? So whenever uh, the, there's, no, there's a mix, mismatch between the demands and pressures of work and the knowledge and ability of the worker. So there's going to be occupational stress. And there's going to be failure of coping with that uh, work demands and pressure. So that is nothing but your occupational stress. So uh, that's about it. And uh, we end with the topic here. Thank you.